Hi everyone, welcome. So this session is gonna be all about scaling out backstage. And the focus for this session is gonna be the backend. My colleague Hemma had an amazing talk about um, some accessibility on the front end, but now we're gonna focus on the backend. And the goal of this talk is to give an answer to many, the many questions that we have received on Discord during the years regarding this matter. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Vincenzo. I'm a Vince Cam on the internet. Um, I'm a senior engineer at Spotify. Um, I'm part, I live in Sweden, where I moved nine years ago from Italy. And uh, I'm part of the core team of Backstage, working with the core framework and all things open source. And this is our agenda for today. So we're going to start looking at the structure of a new Backstage app. Then we're going to check how communication, how plugins communicate together. And then we will transition into the main part of this talk, which is about finding some ways for scanning out your Backstage instance. And then later, we will look at an application of one of these approaches for scanning out Backstage by looking at our own uh, Spotify internal developer portal deployment. And then we will end up with, with some final recommendations. So in order to start, I would like to start this talk with a story. The story of a person seeing Backstage for the first time, myself, three years ago. It took me three months to understand what Backstage was doing, but this is for another time. And I remember the first time I saw a Backstage app, it, it looked really straightforward to me. Uh, it was a JavaScript project, I knew JavaScript, so probably that helped. And uh, that JavaScript project contained a Yarn Mon repo with, some, with a plugin directory where you could build your own plugins there. So you build your own plugins under this directory, and you could also install um, an open source plugin directly in your Backstage instance. And once you run this command, yarn start dash backend, this command basically takes the entire app, takes all the plugins, bundle together, and run in a single process. I found this really, really straightforward. Then I started working on Backstage, and I remember I was working on one of our, our internal plugins, and at a certain point, I had to retrieve some data from another plugin. For simplicity, let's imagine that I was working on a, on a to-do plugin, implementing a real, um, a classical to-do app. And at a certain point, I had to extend the functionality of a to-do app by, for example, showing the author of each to-do. And let's assume that the author of, of the to-do are uh, ingested into catalog as a user entities. So I basically I had to retrieve some data from catalog. I didn't know how to do it, so I basically look at the source code um, just to find a code snippet I could copy paste. And I found out that there was a very handy catalog client there with a bunch of containing a bunch of methods and within all these methods there was the net, the method I needed, get entity by ref. Uh, the code looked legit, so I just copy pasted it and boom I had my entity and I implemented basically the feature, I retrieved some data at, at the first shot. Um, I found this really, really, really good. Um, then, I'm a very curious person. I want to know how, how this catalog works. And I actually dug into the code of this getEntityByRef method and found something really interesting. This is the code. I've simplified a bit. Does anyone recognize what this is doing? So this is a typical REST request. So my plugin was trying to retrieve some data from catalog using a REST request. I honestly thought this was a bug because it was pointless. I mean, I knew the two plugins were running in the same app. So why was my plugin opening like a HTTP connection just to retrieve a bunch of data that was there. And so this was really confusing to me. So, but I'm very fortunate because I work at Spotify and I have some colleagues who know about Backstage. So I reached out to the team internally, claiming that this was a bug and that should, we should fix as soon as possible. And Freben answered me. I'm sure he, he has answered many of your questions on Discord, it is awesome. 
And he told me that the fact that both plugins live in the same process is not always guaranteed. That, the answer confused me. I mean, what do you mean? I know the plugins run on the same process of my machine. And he said that that's because I was using the default deployment option. But additionally, there are many other ways you could deploy backstage. And there is a way to deploy, to deploy the plugin separately. I found this was magic. This was mind blowing. This was the missing piece, that, something that I missed from Backstage. You can deploy the plugin separately, and Backstage knows exactly how to reach out to the plugin. But still, how does it work? I mean, Backstage is very versatile. You can deploy on Kubernetes, or so on a Raspberry, or on a virtual machine. How could Backstage? to know the plug where the plugin is deployed. So I reached out to the team, and I think I was annoying so, them so much that Ben jumped into the discussion, and he said, hey, buddy, look at your code. It's there, discovery service. Do you remember the code I showed about the catalog? Discovery service. You pass a plugin to Discovery Service, and Discovery Service gives you exactly the address of that plugin. This is where the magic was. So I was so happy. Now I knew where the magic was. So I, I dug into the source code of, the, of uh, Discovery Service. Do you want to see it? Here it is. So Discovery Service knows exactly where a plugin is uh, located. But unfortunately, batteries are not included. Just to clarify this example, the default implementation of Discovery Service can resolve the address of the plugins only for those plugins who were deployed in the same Backstage app. So if you want to deploy your plugin uh, separately, you need to provide your own implementation of Discovery Service. And uh, you can do by like providing your own implementation, your own class, overriding this uh, get base URL method. But actually, there is another another way of doing that that we have released. That was released like less than a year ago. We haven't advertised so much. Um, probably this is a point for improvement. And basically, you can configure Discovery Service directly in your app config. You can list that in case your plugins have an address that doesn't change, you can um, register them directly in app config, and then uh, Discovery Service will resolve them automatically. So remember, if you want to deploy the plugin separately, you need to provide your own implementation of Discovery Service. What if you don't? Well, if you don't, you can still scale out backstage. Let me show you how. So this is the first, first approach. This is a, this is a backstage app. Um, you can see at the bottom I have uh, some core services um, containing like logging, uh, configuration, and, and uh, CLI and other stuff. And you can attach plugins to the instance. Right now I have six of them installed. Um, so if you want to scale this, uh, one approach is you just take your instance, replicate it. And put a load balancer on front, routing the request. This approach is absolutely valid. Pro and cons of this approach. It's absolutely the easiest way. You don't have to change code. You could just replicate the instance without changing code, and it will work. But the downside is that if you have um, a plugin that requires more resources, for example, requires more memory, or requires um, receive more requests, or maybe steal the event loop, that plugin might cause other plugins to starve. So to the point that other plugins might not serve any request. And the other downside is that if you don't provide your own discovery service implementation, plugin can only communicate only with other plugins within the same instance. So in this case, uh, the Kubernetes plugin uh, is trying to receive some data from catalog, and uh, it can only reach out to the catalog plugin that resides in the same instance. So this was the first approach. Second one, this is particularly used in case you have a plugin that 
deserve a different treatment, applying that consume more resources. In that case, you can kind of kind you can move out the plugin outside of the main instance and deploy on its own. Um, and with this with this approach, you can basically scale scale it differently. You can give more memory, a different machine, or more instances. Um, how to do this? You can do this by conditionally enabling plugins. So in this uh, snippet, I have enabled scaffold searching Kubernetes plugin in the main instance, but I've also enabled catalog in a secondary instance. Um, this is actually, I mean, you can do this with just a bunch of line of codes. And uh, pro and cons of this approach, you can have more control in case you have a greedy plugin. Um, not so many code changes are needed since you can uh, just conditionally enable plugins. But still, plugins can only communicate with other plugins within the same instance. But now the plugin is a bit bigger. If you go back with the previous example, where Kubernetes plugin was trying to receive, uh, retrieve some data from catalog, now catalog is not always there. It's not anymore there. So it can communicate. So you remember you need to provide your own discovery service uh, configuration. So this was the second approach. Now let's move to the third one, which is uh, it kind, of, kind of goes to the extreme of the previous approach. And it consists of deploying each plugin separately from each other. You can do this by creating small, uh, many different apps, backstage apps, containing just the core functionality and the code of a single plugin. And you can deploy them separately. Uh, pro and cons of this approach, now you have absolutely freedom how you want to scale the plugins. You can do whatever you want. Um, but that's, I don't think that's the biggest advantage. For me, the biggest advantage is that you can set clear ownership on a plugin. Since the plugins are now have their own repository, you can have a team owning the plugin end to end, from the code to deploying to the reliability of the plugin. And I think this advantage is massive. But on the down a downside is that this is hard to maintain. Now you don't have a backstage app anymore. You have many backstage apps that you need to upgrade. And the other downside is that, of course, uh, remember to configure, it's not a downside, but remember to uh, configure your discovery service. So now we went through all these approaches. Now let's move to an application of, our, of one of these approaches by looking at our own uh, Spotify internal developer portal. And when we talk about our own developer, inter Spotify internal developer portal, it's a bit tricky because of historical reason. So we, as, as many of you know, we created Backstage at Spotify in 2016, and then later we donated to the CNCF. And Backstage was created in 2016, actually there. Uh, but the open source version was released in 2020. And these are basically two different products. The internal Backstage used Java for the services, while the um, open source version use, is written in Node. And, uh, the internal one was actually very bound to the technology that we use at Spotify, while the open source, you can basically swap any, any pieces. And of course, during this year, we have developed more than 100 plugins divided between the front-end and back-end plugins. So our internal instance was massive. But in 2020, we also, after a couple of months, uh, we realized that we had to move to backstage open source as soon as possible, because the speed of backstage open source was insanely faster than our internal developer portal. So we decided to adopt it and try to deprecate the internal one. But the internal one wasn't all bad. There were a few pillars that we want to keep when migrating to the backstage, op to backstage open source. So the internal one, as I said, contained more than 100 plugins. But this, those plugins were built in a distributed way. So there wasn't a team owning all the plugins. But instead, many teams at Spotify developed all these plugins. And of course, they were, they had their own, each plugin had their own repository. So I don't know. Um, so any team owned, owned that plugin end to end, from the code to deploying to the reliability. And we want to keep this when migrating to the new backstage. That's why we chose the third approach. So we deployed each plugin separately. 
And in the picture, you can see our internal backstage backend legacy, backstage backend instance at the top. It was a Java service with, a graph, with GraphQL and a bunch of resolvers that basically collect data from the underlying uh, backend services. And at the bottom, you can see all the open source framework, uh, open source plugin deployed separately. Um, and this, this was uh, very necessary for us for, uh, to keep um, to, uh, to keep the, the kind of way of working that we were using at Spotify. And now, before we end, I would like to end with a, just a kind of uh, um, an advice, because I know how it is. You go to a random conference listening for a random guy from a tech, a random tech company telling you how to do things. Then you go back home to your own team saying, oh, look, this is how Spotify is doing. We should do the same. Um, so, and then problem start. So, in order to avoid this, I basically did some research and came up with a question with a um, binary answer, yes or no. And answering this question will uh, give you a clear direction whether you need to follow the same approach we are using as Spotify, so deploying the plugin separately. And the question is, are you Spotify? Uh, for many of you today, the answer will be no. And with Spotify, of course, I mean a company at the same scale of Spotify. The thing is, all these approaches are absolutely valid. They all have strengths and weaknesses. But if you choose the third approach, then you commit to it's going to be hard to maintain if you don't have the right tool for, for maintaining different repositories. And as Spotify internally, we have tools like FleetShift, which allow us to uh, push changes to re different repository with just like a, a bunch of clicks. Uh, so please choose wisely. Remember to, in, to configure your discovery service in case you want to uh, deploy the plugin distributedly. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have so much time to cover the last, um, last bullet point. But if you have service to service enabled between services, you need to make sure that different instances can understand each other. But we didn't have so much time to cover that. So I would like to invite you to uh, Cube Crash on April 24th. Uh, and it's an online day where we will go through a lot of talk about how to build your own developer portal from the basics to the most advanced, advanced topic we didn't have time to cover today. This is, this is uh, QR code, and uh, thank you so much. Any questions while uh, we set up the panel for the next panel? So any questions for, uh, yeah, go ahead. So with the uh, distributed backend plugin model, one of the things that we've seen, uh, we have lots of internal plugins. Some of those plugins from different teams uh, incorporate different secrets as well. Uh, so one of the benefit we were thinking of with being able to separate the backend is being able to separate the secrets as well so they're not all uh, being used by the same backend. Uh, any thoughts on that? Um, are you talking about, for example, authentication secret, this kind of things? Yeah, for back-end downstream systems, things like that. Um, uh, so right now it seems like in our single back-end uh, backstage instance that we have tons of secrets and secret sp sprawl from different teams enabling their plugins. Yeah. Um, I can bring you a clear um, use case about like when, uh, for example, when we talk about enabling service-to-service -service authentication, you know, for example, you need to provide your own key. And in that case, if you're gonna distribute and deploy uh, your plugin, you need to share that key in many, many ways. Uh, what we did internally in that case was to kind of use GCP service off for providing that key. So basically, you don't kind of share secrets, but instead your, your instance, your, our cloud instance kind of 
inject the secret for, for you so that you don't have shared secrets in that case. That could be like a, one way for solving that. But of course, I guess like, I mean, every, every uh, you can have different cases where you probably need to kind of share the same secrets. And it was less about the plugin authentication, more about the downstream systems. But that gives me more to think about maybe okay. an API gateway or service match uh, traffic permissions or something. Thanks. Any other questions? Come, come. Thank you. Um, my question is how does this scale, if you do this distributed uh, per plugin deployment and whatnot, uh, how does this scale the configuration file, the app config do I Can I maintain different configs uh, because there's like the base URL stuff in it and per plugin configuration, what do I do with the config file? Yeah, in that case, you will need to kind of replicate a config, kind of strip out config which don't belong to, belong to the plugins that are installed in an instance. So. And actually, I don't, th I don't think it's a big problem, because if you consider that different team owns different plugins, so it's absolutely fine if, they don't, if, you don't, if you have to replicate a config or kind of provide a custom config for each, for each plugin. But this is the way we are doing it. It's like each plugin has its own config that is different from the config that uh, other plugins are doing, are, are, are using it. Okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, one short question. You talked about splitting up backend plugins. What if you have a large number of frontend plugins? How how do you suggest we should uh, distribute them? Yeah. Uh, I don't think we have um, kind of changed the way you, we work with frontend plugins. We have an instance with I don't know how many plugins. It's like around 100, uh, and they're, all the front, front of plugins are in the single monolith. Uh, and that worked for us. Um, the only problem we've seen is that it takes so much time. At a certain point, when you have a lot of plugins, it takes so much time to build, uh, to build that, the, the front end. And the way we are solved is like to provide an experimental wide support, which kind of speed up this process, and it's actually kind of working for us. So the way we, we, we decide to solve it is keep the monolith with the, all the front-end plugins, but kind of change, improve the tools that we use for building the, those plugins. But the, right now, for the front-end, uh, it kind of, that's uh, the approach. We haven't changed. So everything is in a monolith, all the plugins, yeah. Hey, thanks. Um, there was a discussion about this uh, dynamic loading of plugins. How does it work when you have like multiple instances running? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, I have. There are more people in the room who can answer this question, but I'm, unfortunately, I'm not. I can't answer this. So I can go if you want. <laughs> uh, I don't want to steal the show. So no, no, can, go for it. So we can talk uh, back there, but. You can load plugins as like uh, through module federation, so you can load plugins from a remote location, from a remote server as a browser asset. So it's it doesn't matter. It can be even hosted on an um, HTTP server anywhere else. It's just a JavaScript asset that is loaded to browser, and since backstage is all client rendered, um, you don't care where the assets live, right? So you just load it from somewhere, so you can have it distributed per plugin. Each plugin can be living in, on its separate endpoint, on its separate host, or whatever. You just maintain some verification that this is the plugin I want to load, this is the version I want to load, and you can load it from wherever. All right, is there any questions? Otherwise, we'll go to the panel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vince. Thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo.